Hello, good morning from Brazil. Welcome to this session of our series on the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which will focus on refugees and human rights. Uh, we are taking the opportunity to celebrate both the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also the fifth anniversary of the Global Compact on Refugees, and to reflect a little bit on how these two instruments can come together and increase protection, increase human rights implementation for refugees and other people uh, in need of international protection. We have a very interesting um, and dear panel today, uh, we have um, that are, is going to share uh, uh, their knowledge and expertise with us. So uh, I would like to welcome and thank Professor Jeff Gilbert, who holds an S SJD and an LLM from the University of Virginia, which he obtained after graduating from the University of Leicester. He's a professor at the University of X, where he holds the DeMello Chair. He is the co-chair of the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network and joint editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Refugee Law. He has worked with UNHCR on a series of research projects and training programs for over 25 years. We also have Dr. Madeleine Garlic, who is the Chief of Protection Policy and Legal Advice Section in the Division of International Protection at UNHCR in Geneva. She holds a PhD degree from Webout University, a master's degree in law from Cambridge University, and arts and law degrees from Monash University. She has served in Iraq, Cyprus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the European Union. She teaches on an occasional basis at Science Po and at the Center for Refugee Studies at Oxford. We also have Ms. Marisa Leon Gomez Sonnet, who has a master's degree in global affairs, international peace studies concentration from the University of Notre Dame, and a bachelor's degree in global studies, international development, and French from South Regina University. She has worked on policy and advocacy on migration, refugee, and human rights issues, extending from the multilateral sphere to the national, regional, and city levels. Currently, she's a partnership and stakeholders coordinator at RCET refugees seeking equal access at the table, where she works with different partners to amplify refugee leadership ecosystems and increase meaningful refugee participation at the state and international levels. And as our debater, we have Dr. Maria Beatriz Bonanogueira, who holds a PhD in international relations from the Universidade de Brasília, a master's in forced migration from the University of Oxford, and a master's in human rights from LSE. She has been a fellow of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy of the Kennedy School of Government of Harvard University, the coordinator of the National Committee for Refugee Brazils, and has worked for the presidency of Brazil. She's the chief or the head of the Sao Paulo Field Office of UNHCR Brazil. As you can see, we have a very diverse panel uh, that will bring different approaches and perspectives for this issue of human rights of refugees. And uh, with that, without further ado, I'm going to cede the floor uh, to Professor Jeff Gilbert so he can uh, join us. Just two questions of housekeeping. Please, uh, whoever is not presenting, I would ask to keep the mic um, off so there is no uh, buzzing sounds or anything to, to stop us from hearing each other. And if anybody has any questions, they can post them in the chat and we'll get back to them in the Q&A session after uh, all the talks. Jeff, thank you so much for being here, and we are looking forward to learning more from you. Thank you, um, particularly to the Universidad Católica de Santos. I hope that's a close approximation. Um, I have a Portuguese colleague. I sought advice. This is a wonderful opportunity to address these events from an academic perspective. It's the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the fifth anniversary of the Global Compact on Refugees. But it's worth adding that it's also the 25th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. And there are linkages between these three documents and how we might see developments as we go forward with the GCR, as um, so that on the 75th anniversary of the Global Compact on Refugees, if we still need it, okay, we'll be able to say, ah, oh, yes, I remember when. Um, so I am going to share my screen. 
This is not necessarily going to be quick, but we'll try. We have liftoff. I hope you can see that. Yes, excellent. Right. Um, so, where should, where do we start? What's the beginning? And as a good academic international lawyer, my starting point is always Article 38, 1 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. Treaties, custom, general principles. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is basically a mere declaration of the United Nations General Assembly. As such, it's Eleanor Roosevelt's wish list to Father Christmas 1948. And I blow my nose on the Universal Declaration because it is a mere declaration of the General Assembly. It's not a binding treaty. It's not binding in and of itself. However, it was adopted by the General Assembly, as was the Global Compact on Refugees in 2018, which is more than could be said for the guiding principles on internal displacement. And that matters. We'll come back to that later. So, it's not binding in and of itself. The four most important words in that is in and of itself. General Assembly declarations do not give rise to international law directly. However, could the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reflect customary international law? Through this, as ever, we need state practice and opinio juris. And I know that I'm probably teaching most of you, as we would say in the UK, to suck eggs, okay? Everybody knows this already. But unless you go back to this at this stage, when we come on to discuss the Global Compact and the guiding principles, it becomes less evident. Whereas if we do it now, we start with these basics, it makes life easy. So um, a declaration, a resolution of the General Assembly can be found to reflect customary international law through state practice in opinio juris. And that's been endorsed by the International Court of Justice in the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons and the Chagas Island case of 2022. So as you can see, this is a consistent idea within international law that the International Court of Justice has upheld it. And whenever we are looking for whether a General Assembly declaration resolution has become customary international law, we should look at the state practice of the most affected states, as was set out in North Sea Continental Shelf. And why is this important? Well, Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights the right to seek and enjoy asylum, that never made it into either the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. As such, it's the orphan provision within the Universal Declaration, unless we find that the Universal Declaration, in whole or in part, reflects customary international law, Article 14 is not going to have the authority that we would want to see such an important provision have. And of course, I am happy to say that we know through long practice that Article 14 is regarded as customary international law. And this has relevance when we move to the Global Compact. So the Global Compact in paragraph five, which sets out the guiding principles of the Global Compact. If you read the whole of paragraph five, and by that I mean you actually read the footnotes as well. Academics stick footnotes at the bottom of the page, not to stop the page fraying, 
okay we put them there because they're meant to be read so if you read paragraph five plus all its footnotes you'll actually see that paragraph five of the global compact talks about the global compact being grounded in international refugee law and footnote i think it's 14 specifically sets out Article 14, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as part of that international refugee law. Okay, so there you are, a direct link between Article 4, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Global Compact. However, okay, those who are sort of more au fait with the Global Compact will say, ah, oh, yes, Jeff. But you're forgetting Article 4. And Article 4 specifically says that the Global Compact is not legally binding. And I would agree, the Global Compact is not legally binding in and of itself. That does not mean that it could not, in part, have provisions that, are, that reflect customary international law. And paragraph five, which talks about enhancing protection and assistance of refugees and pro providing fairer and more predictable burden and responsibility sharing within the international community as a whole. These are ideas that are fundamental to all states affected by forced displacement, whether that be the source state the receiving state, or the states that then go on to provide humanitarian support, which we saw the High Commissioner talk about in the meeting in Geneva this week, how generous some states have been, not in terms of receiving refugees in large numbers, but in terms of trying to provide UNHCR with the funding. Particular countries as we get to the end of the year, have been giving more funding. Other countries give an earmarked funding so that UNHCR can carry out its obligations under its statutes. And you begin to see how all these documents begin to fit together. So, yes, paragraph four, global compact, it's not legally binding. But all that means is that the global compact isn't legally binding. It doesn't mean that its content cannot reflect customary international law. And I would refer there to paragraph 49. And paragraph 49 sets out that the Global Compact will work through commitments, commitments by the international community. And the commitment might well be a legal commitment. And paragraph 49 precedes and refers to Section 3B of the Global Compact. And Section 3B sets out what the, what the responsibilities are of hosting states with respect to, let's say, education, protection of women, okay, all livelihoods. All of these ideas, which are spelt out fully in section 3b okay could help us understand better how the global compact explains protection and assistance the rights of refugees and host communities and let's remember host communities could include internally displaced persons so that all these documents are fitting together how all this comes together to help us have a fuller, more rounded picture of what refugee protection means in practice. And all I would say is go back to paragraph five of the Global Compact, look at all the documents that are listed in the footnotes. Although paragraph five is in a document that says it's not legally binding, paragraph four says that, Paragraph five lists in the footnotes so many treaties 
but treaties on human rights and humanitarian law, which are listed there, by almost sort of as a, as a given, only set out the bare bones of what those rights are. What Section 3B of the Global Compact allows us to do is think, how might we understand the right to work, which you'll find in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights? How might we understand non-discrimination found again in both covenants, particularly in the light of the experience of women and girls who are forcibly displaced? How do we understand inhuman and degrading treatment if we don't think about, at the same time, SGBV, which is one of the worst aspects of forced displacement. So can I now take you to the document that isn't being celebrated, but which should be celebrated, which is the guiding principles. They were not even a General Assembly resolution. Okay, They were a, do that was a document drafted by three academics up in the Swiss Alps, okay, who passed them on to Francis Deng, who was the first representative of the Secretary General, okay, on internally displaced persons. We now have a special rapporteur um, on uh, from the Human Rights Council on internally displaced persons. But Francis Deng started off with a document that was given to the Secretary General, which the Secretary General endorsed. The General Assembly never saw it at that stage. It was adopted without the General Assembly. 20 years on, in 2018, there were a lot of academics writing about how, in the 20 intervening years, the Global Compact, sorry, the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement had moved from being a booklet almost, carried around by humanitarian actors in the field into customary international law through practice. I hate to put it in these terms, but the guiding principles were incredibly lucky to have the conflict in Kosovo almost immediately afterwards because humanitarian actors and academics combined to talk about how the guiding principles could be used and how they were used by the UN and by states in dealing with internal displacement. This active engagement of a document by the humanitarian actors, but with reference to what academics are writing about it, where states endorse it implicitly, state practice, because they, you, they it gets referred to, because the guiding principles were an easy way to understand how to provide international human rights international humanitarian law protections to internally displaced persons. If you take a look at the introduction and scope, it actually says these guiding principles are reflect and are consistent with international human rights law, international humanitarian law. We got state practice through the activities of humanitarian workers in the field. And at this point, we go back to the global compact, with the UNHCR. Now, as everybody knows, Article 35 of the UNHCR, the 1951 Convention, gives the UNHCR a supervisory function over the 51 Convention. If you take a look at paragraph 8A of the statute of UNHCR, you will see that it has a similar function with regard to the protection of refugees under treaties made up to that end. The Global Compact was drafted by UNHCR, but it was affirmed by the General Assembly. And it refers to international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and rule of law. Fortunately, um, and I, have to, I do claim some credit here, I was the one academic in the formal consultations on the Global Compact. And there have been in the initial iterations of the Global Compact, several references to rule of law 
And as we approach the end, one particular government tried to remove all references to rule of law. Fortunately, just before we got to the last reference to it that they were trying to remove, the interpreters in the UN said, it's time for lunch. So we had to stop. And I went and had a conversation with the relevant representative of that country and said, ah, yes, but you need it here in, I think it's paragraph eight or nine, on prevention, because that's good for all states. And so the one, it even refers to rule of law in the global compact. Imagine you've got international human rights law, you've got international humanitarian law, you've got rule of law all being referred to within the global compact. Surely, if it is used more and more by humanitarian actors, particularly UNHCR, not just in protracted situations of displacement, but in emergency situations too, because it's relevant there, then over time, through adoption by states of what humanitarian actors are doing based on global compact with endorsement by those states of the global compact, in years to come, we will be talking about how the global compact may not be legally binding in and of itself, but it is reflective in parts of customary international law. And I would suggest in particular, section 3b in those in that regard and on that note i will stop sharing my screen and i will hand back the floor to professor jubilant thank you so very much jeff uh, for this lecture on, on on the issue i think we learned a lot and it was very comprehensive and thank you for bringing up the uh, guiding principles uh here in brazil we also have the 35th anniversary of our uh, national constitution this year which has a uh, political asylum and uh, respect for human rights among their principles so i think it, it's a year of uh, very relevant uh, celebrations and, and, and anniversary. And of course, next week, we will have the second Global Refugee Forum, which is a very relevant way to, to engage uh, all state actors, but also other uh, stakeholders, especially refugees, and the debates on refugee protections and solutions. Uh, the forum as the GCR are uh, very much uh, organized by uh, UNHCR. So we are very lucky to have a UNHCR perspective uh, in, the, in the talk of Dr. Madeline Garlic, who we are very pleased and honored to, to welcome, especially just a, a few days away from such a major event, which makes her, us I wonder how her, her schedule is going to be for the next couple of days, probably days of 48 hours instead of 24. Uh, so we, we are especially, especially thankful for you to being here with us. And uh, we looking forward to hearing you. Uh, it's um, the, the floor is all yours, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. And really, let me also thank the Universidad Católica de Santos. It's an honor to be here with you all today. And as you say, a very timely moment. And I greatly appreciate the chance to step back from the hustle and bustle of organizational matters to think about the principles that we all are recognizing in this event today and which underpin uh, the uh, very important goals of the Global Compact and what we hope to achieve in the coming days. As we prepare to commemorate three quarters of the century since the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and I'm very conscious that on Human Rights Day, just about to come up, there'll be some important events to mark this all around the world. I think really it's difficult to uh, uh, overstate its importance uh, as a turning point really in the evolution of the international human rights law regime. Article 14, as Professor Gilbert has said, set out the right of all to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution. The first time that we have this concept reflected in an international instrument from the General Assembly and a, a crucial foundation thereby was laid for the international refugee regime that has emerged from it uh, subsequently. Of course, at the time, uh, it was certainly not seen as something which was readily enforceable. It wasn't clear against whom the right to seek and enjoy asylum could be claimed. 
And so although there were important prin uh, principles asserted therein, it was, uh, there was much work still to be done to give this effect in practice. And so some three years later, with the conclusion of the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, we had an international instrument for the first time, which it enshrined concrete obligations, binding states to protect refugees that fall within the definition of Article 1A of that convention, but also to recognize and accord to them a very specific and practical set of rights, rights which, which effectively form the content of international protection and give practical effect to the concept of asylum rights to association, to access to courts, to work, to housing, to public education and more. Rights that have enabled millions of people worldwide to restart their lives and to find solutions uh, on the basis of that important framework. In the current context, we hear a lot of skepticism, particularly at political level, about the relevance and applicability of the human rights framework more broadly, but also the Refugee Convention in particular in many fora. We hear often politicians telling us that they think the 1951 convention is outdated or no longer relevant or adapted to modern challenges. In the face of globalization, large scale movements in many parts of the world, complex drivers of displacement and politically sensitive climate around refugees, uh, many politicians argue it's time to reassess the foundations of the regime from scratch. But I think it's an interesting critique and perhaps now is a good moment to step back and ask ourselves really what's underlying this. There seems to be an implied assumption that at the time when the 1951 convention was adopted shortly after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that states were feeling generous and well equipped to take in and protect refugees, unlike today. But of course, what we know from history is that nothing could be further from the truth. States were coming out of World War II, real tensions were still subsisting between some states that had been at war just a few years earlier, Europe, but also other parts of the world were in economic crisis and physical ruin. And yet states agreed that they needed this instrument, that they needed to agree on ways to ensure protection and solutions for refugees. And in that uh, perspective, I think it's interesting then to consider whether there really is a basis for states to argue with all of the institutions, with all of the resources, with all of the provisions in national laws, institutional frameworks and otherwise, whether they're really unable to uh, meet the challenges of displacement with the help of the Refugee Convention. I think what another contradiction we see in these kinds of arguments relate to the concerns many states express about unmanaged movements and arrivals at borders the uncontrolled movements that some referred to. If that's really the case, that states are concerned about how they can preserve order and how they can manage large scale arrivals, it doesn't make logical sense to say that they will dispense with the one, one of the most widely ratified international treaties uh, uh, on the global stage. With 149 contracting states, which are party to the convention or its protocol, it provides at international level, the one instrument which gives a basis for consistent responses and for international cooperation, which as the preamble for the conven uh, convention underlines is essential given the inherently international character of refugee challenges, meaning that no state can manage those challenges alone. Perhaps it's unsurprising that uh, HCR would argue that the Refugee Convention and the human rights framework established on the basis of the Universal Declaration are more needed today than ever. But we argue that not just on the basis of our own mandate and prioritise, but also because of the evidence we see of the way in which it is being applied and used on a, a, a widespread basis. We don't disregard the challenges. It's important to recognise that they are real. And amongst some that I could name, of course, is the scale of displacement worldwide today. As of mid-2023, UNHCR uh, noted that there are some 110 million people displaced worldwide, the majority of whom are within 
the boundaries of their own countries, internally displaced people for whom the guiding principles are particularly important, as Jeff has noticed. We've got 37 million refugees who fall uh, within the mandate of UNHCR or the UN Re Relief and Works Agency, UNWA. Palestinians facing enormous challenges right now, uh, uh, given the situation in Gaza. We also see enormous challenges around the complexity of movements worldwide. People moving for many intersecting reasons, including persecution, conflict, violence, and human rights violations, which uh, in many cases will be the basis for a refugee protection claim, but also people who move because of economic crises, poor governance, and in many cases, the impacts of climate change and disaster. We also see in terms of significant challenges worldwide, the dearth of solutions. In 2022, UNHCR recorded that some 6 million refugees and IDPs together were, no, were officially confirmed as returning to their areas of countries uh, of origin. Some 51,000 refugees were naturalized in the countries which had granted them protection. And uh, uh, approximately 120,000 people resettled. Tiny numbers compared with the numbers of those displaced, including newly displaced in the course of the same year. We also see very real challenges around protracted situations defined by UNHCR as 25,000 people or more displaced for five years or more. And uh, it was some uh, 20, some, some uh, 24, no, sorry, some 66% of the world's refugees were uh, considered to be in protracted situations as of the middle of this year. We have 59 protracted situations in 37 countries, highlighting the urgent need for redoubled efforts for more solutions. But in the face of these uh, challenges, it's important also to underline that we see some really important opportunities. And the first one I'd like to underline is the respect for law. Uh, and the principles of the international human rights law regime, as well as the refugee protection regime for those who are forcibly displaced. Millions of refugees and others in need of international protection are recognized and accorded status every day by states around the world. We see refugees who succeed and thrive and who help their own communities, as well as others who are displaced in a vast number of settings around the world. These things don't always make the media in the same way that asylum related challenges do. And this is one of the reasons why next week is going to be such an important opportunity to showcase some of those successes and the positive uh, examples of state practice and the uh, benefits that flow from that for individual refugees, but also for their host communities. We see that the New York Declaration created some critical opportunities for us. In the face of some skepticism about whether the legal framework is able to meet challenges, the New York Rec Declaration reaffirmed in a, a, a unanimous uh, resolution of the General Assembly, the importance of the 1951 convention and its 1967 protocol as the foundation of the international protection system. It had also acknowledged the efforts of states which are not parties to the refugee instruments, but which nonetheless, in many cases worldwide, are affording protection in practice. The New York Declaration also, very importantly, recalled the crucial role played by regional refugee law. And if I can add one more anniversary to the list of those we have talked about today, there is, of course, next year, the 40th anniversary of the Cartagena Declaration, a crucial instrument in uh, the uh, region in which uh, Brazil finds itself, and a very important uh, instrument also in terms of establishing a wider definition of refugees, recognizing the uh, evolving interpretation and understanding of refugee protection needs over the course of time. The New York Declaration, of course, called for two compacts to be developed and, and adopted, a global compact on safe, orderly and regular migration and the global compact on refugees, both of which were affirmed by the General Assembly two years later in 2018. And in the GCR, we really do see that there is a crucial opportunity for states to look at what is needed to support the implementation of the legal principles which are binding 
and as Jeff has outlined, are uh, firmly reiterated and reinforced in the text of the Global Compact, but also concrete mechanisms and arrangements to support the implementation of those principles in practice. As a crucial other additional element, we have also seen an explicit acknowledgement of the crucial nature of responsibility sharing and the need to ensure more equitable and predictable uh, cooperation between states to address the needs of refugees. And this is a particularly important statement given what we know today, which is that some 86% of the world's refugees are in low and middle income countries, often close to the countries of origin of refugees and often least equipped to ensure their protection and access to rights in circumstances often where they have insufficient resources to ensure access to rights for their own citizens. So the Global Compact really, with its four objectives, has sought to map out a way forward for all of us in this field to focus our efforts, whether that be through research uh, uh, and policy making, whether it's through practical interventions on the ground, or uh, whether it's uh, through advocacy to states to improve their responses. We have then next week at the Global Compact, an opportunity to hear from the multiple stakeholders that have also been recognized in the Global Compact and whose crucial role is one of the most important innovations that the Compact brings to the international level when looking at refugee protection challenges. The multi-stakeholder approach of course means that uh, the Compact uh, and the General Assembly and states therein thereby have recognised that the whole of society has a role to play in supporting the protection of refugees and helping them find solutions. And crucially and centrally, this means recognising the agency, the leadership of refugees. And this is an absolutely pivotal innovation which has taken too long, e even in the work of UNHCR, to be recognised and enshrined, but which I think we will see next week really has led to a uh, far wider recognition of the incredible, uh, important perspectives that refugees bring to the debates at international level about strengthening responses, highlighting the gaps, and telling all of us that work in the field about what could be done differently and better, including, first and foremost, UNHCR. We will also, however, be seeing civil society actors, academics, private sector entities, including enterprises, faith-based actors, and local governments taking the floor in the plenary and in a whole range of different events that are planned around the Global Compact. And what's very important, I think, to recall consistently is that they are all there to supplement, but not to take the place of states which remain bound by their obligations and need to work with other partners, but cannot be allowed to divest themselves of their responsibilities or seem to be reading them down. Before closing, I just want to point to a couple of the areas in which we are expecting there will be multi-stakeholder pledges. And I really do encourage all that are interested in this area to look at UNHCR's website. You can just search UNHCR GRF and you will, you will find it. And there is an extraordinarily rich tapestry of areas in which we will have, we will see commitments made by a wide range of actors to measures that have the potential to make very significant differences to people's lives. Just focusing on the legal area alone, there are important pledges that have been made to support asylum capacity development, including in states with nascent or developing asylum systems. We have a very significant pledge from the legal community, including private lawyers, legal aid providers, from civil society, uh, law firms and bar associations. And this is a particularly significant one because it builds on an extraordinary amount that has been done since the last GRF. There, were, uh, uh, there was a pledge made in 2019 for some 131,000 hours of legal assistance pro bono that lawyers were ready to make. In the years since then, that has been surpassed exponentially to the, uh, with the result that some 500,000 pro bono hours have been contributed by law firms. And um, one of my colleagues made the calculation that this is worth some 400 million US dollars. 
And so the importance of uh, the uh, concrete help that legal uh, service providers can make to the difference to the lives of refugees is, is really something important to, to consider. We also are seeking to uh, see states make commitments to adopt or amend legislation where there are gaps or where there is a need to adjust restrictive provisions or provisions where we've seen manifest gaps over the years. There will be pledges made on combating trafficking in persons and particularly protecting victims, on uh, developing alternatives to detention uh, and in many other areas related to, to legal protection. There are also crucial pledges that are expected in the areas of resettlement and complementary pathways, including new skills-based programs that states will be establishing to enable refugees to take up labor market opportunities, support to family re reunification, community sponsorship, and many more. But let me also mention in particular the pledges that we are anticipating in the academic sphere. And Liliana, uh, you have played a crucial role in this. And I really want to take this opportunity to play tribute to you in your capacity as the co-chair of the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network, a network established under the Global Compact uh, on Refugees, but also your uh, personal commitment to this, which has really brought energy and uh, has enabled you to reach out to a vast number of actors who have uh, taken part in this. And I think the last numbers are still coming in, but it's my understanding that we have a number of some 16,000 facilitated entry places for undergraduate students around the world who have been forcibly displaced or are refugees and several hundred scholarships as well as additional places also for postgraduate. So the difference that this is going to make to the lives of individual refugees and their families is immeasurable. And I really wanna pay tribute to all of those who are part of this work. So with that, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to questions and discussions and really want to thank you once again for organizing this very timely event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, I think it was really interesting how uh, your talk complements Jeff's. So we started with a more theoretical uh, and legal approach, and then we, we move towards the more practical uh, challenges and how they all come together. And uh, we can see how um, the, the forum is connected to the GCR, which is connected to other uh, relevant uh, documents. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And I think um, I'm going to just highlight one aspect uh, of your talk, uh, that is the, the, the relevance of refugees engagement and meaningful participation in all discussions, both legal and practical. Uh, we all know that if you're thinking about human rights, we are thinking about autonomy, which means one's possibility of rule their lives and how refuge um, is a rupture in that uh, and that people need to, to start um, re reassessing and uh, taking charge again of, of their lives and how important it is for us to, uh, to, to have refugees and other dis displaced persons' uh, voices heard and uh, actually reflected in all our actions. And that's why we are very lucky to have Marisa Leon from our seat with, with us today to share on that perspective. Thank you so much, Marisa, for sharing your time, your knowledge, your perspective, and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Liliana, and, and thank you also uh, for the invitation to the Universidad Católica de Santos. I'm sorry, I can't do a Portuguese accent like Jeff did, but <laughs> I'm from Honduras, so Spanish is my first my first language. Um, but happy to be here with um, you know fellow partners from the region. So my name is Marisa, and I work with refugees seeking equal access at the table. We are an international refugee-led initiative working to enhance the effectiveness of the global refugee system and how it responds to refugee issues by co-designing mechanisms that amplify refugee leadership ecosystems and increase the participation of refugees at both national, international, and even regional levels in a way that's meaningful, sustainable, and transformative. The current situation, as has been outlined by my fellow, my fellow panelists, um, is that refugees and forcibly displaced people across the globe remain a dire and alarming humanitarian challenge 
marked by ongoing conflict, geopolitical instabilities, and the consequences of climate change. Yearly, millions are driven from their homes to seek safety and dignity, but have faced immense hardships and obstacles in the pursuit of those uh, objectives. It is within this context that I'm here to talk to you about the importance of refugees themselves being included in the decision-making processes of global refugee policies. These policies directly impact their lives and refugees should be part of conversations and have a tangible influence on how countries make those decisions. So as it was already outlined um, by, by the other panelists as well, um, in the global refugee policy sphere, we have the 2016 New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. The New York Declaration lays out explicit commitments for stakeholders on the human rights for refugees and migrants, regardless of status, and calls out, calls out for the rights of women and girls and promoting their full, equal, and meaningful participation in finding solutions. The declaration leads us to the, the adoption of the new instruments at that time. It's been five years of the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact for Migration. The Global Compact on Refugees, affirmed by the United Nations General Assembly in December 2018, as Steph was explaining, focuses specifically on supporting refugee hosting countries, incre increasing refugee self-reliance and access to third country solutions, as well as improving conditions in countries of origin for return and safety and dignity. This means that the compact has the potential to make a real difference in the lives of refugees and their host communities and to consider opportunities for enhancing res responsibility sharing. The Global Refugee Forum next week here in Geneva, where I'm based, reviews the progress of the implementation of the compact and is an opportunity to measure success towards the achievement of pledges announced in the first forum in 2019 and the opportunity to announce new and improved multi-stakeholder pledges. However, Gatherings such as the GRF, very important in the UN and uh, UN and human rights system, convene a plethora of stakeholders, compromising of member states, humanitarian and development actors, civil society, the private sector, and media. However, opportunities for meaningful participation in high-level meetings are limited for affected populations, including refugees. And if invited, affected populations are often relegated to storytelling and informal advocacy spaces. However, both for the realization of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and for the GCR, which are intrinsically connected and reinforce each other, meaningful participation of affected populations is crucial. The Global Compact of Refugees, paragraph 34, states, responses are most effective when they actively and meaningfully engage those that are intended to protect and assist. Relevant actors will, whenever possible, continue to develop and support consultative processes that enables refugees and host community members to assist in designing appropriate, accessible, and inclusive responses. States and relevant stakeholders will explore how best to include refugees and members of host communities, particularly women, youth, and persons of disabilities, in key forums and processes, as well as diaspora, were relevant. So states have made this commitment on the GCR on paragraph 34, and on the same line, all processes that support the implementation of the Universal, Universal Human Rights Declaration require the meaningful participation of affected communities for an implementation of human rights that's, holist that's holistic. Volker Turk, UN, human rights, uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, has said recently, effective solutions for human rights issues will also need the full contributions of every member of, of every society. Free, meaningful, and active participation by all is essential to bring about real change. We need to draw on the creativity, the skills, and the critical observations of everyone, and especially those who are silenced and harmed in today's malfunctions. In every aspect of decision-making, it is vital to build bridges between people, especially the most affected and the institutions of government and business. So narrowing down on refugees and how we include them in global refugee policies. How do we do that meaningful in a way that's non-tokenistic and a way that's sustainable, that doesn't happen just one off and in a way that refugees feel safe and included. At our seat, meaningful participation occurs when refugees from diverse backgrounds, so we have an age, gender, and diversity component to it, 
have a sustained influence in all four of our decisions, policies, and responses that impact their lives are being designed, implemented, and measured in a manner that is accessible, broad, informed, safe, free, and supported. We work in co-creating refugee advisory mechanisms at the national level so that refugees can have sustained influence at the international level in a way that's non-tokenistic, sustainable, and meaningful. So this refugee advisory boards have been created already by Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and soon, hopefully, Germany. We have also been in close discussions with Brazil. Um, Brazil will include a refugee advisor to the GRF, um, and we're hoping that we can uh, create a refugee advisory body in Brazil, and it will be the first in the Latin American region, the first in host uh, community countries, and the first in what we call um, the Global South. So we're really looking forward to our work in Brazil. How does our work begin? First of all, we want that the refugee advisory mechanisms are, uh, are led by refugees and refugee-led organizations of the countries and the context that we're working on. So we collaborate with refugees, refugee-led initiatives, and all other relevant stakeholders at the national level to start the process to co-create the mechanism with their input and their leadership. We remain open to collaborating with a diverse group at all, all points, so in terms of AGD, and also in terms of policy expertise, because refugees are first responders to the challenges that they face. So often it's refugees themselves that are developing a policy and technical expertise on how to resolve the issues that affect them. We also work closely with the government to ensure that we have their commitment, that they, the government will collaborate with the Refugee Advisory Board. Once we have uh, secured uh, the leadership of, of refugees and secure the commitment of, of, of the government, we work with a selection committee. A selection committee consisting of representatives from civil society, government, private donor community, academia, which are really important in our work, and prominent former refugees to identify, select, and support members of the advisory mechanism. Ultimately, is the selection committee, this neutral committee that is in charge of ensuring um, a diverse inclusion and a non-tokenistic transparent process to select the members of the refugee advisory mechanism. So this ensures that the people that are forming the mechanism are there not only because of their lived experience as refugees, but also because of the policy expertise that they bring to the table. They're selected not based on connections to the government, but actually because of the work uh, and leadership that they showed in their communities. Once we establish the mechanism consistent of uh, former and current refugee leaders, usually around five to 12 members representing key refugee led groups and organizations, the government can consult with them in both national and global refugee policies. In addition, members of the Refugee Advisory Board can recommend a candidate to be a representative as, an, as, a, as a delegate, as a refugee advisor to national delegations for relevant regional and international meetings on refugee issues. Um, in 2019, at the first Global Refugee Forum, Canada was the only country to include a refugee advisor. And just yesterday, we, we finished a training with the current refugee uh, advisors that will be part of the GRF next week. And we are happy to say we have 10. So it's uh, going from one to 10 um, and that, that we have confirmed. I mean, there's 193 member states <laughs> or, uh, or more. So from what we have confirmed and that we're sure uh, 10 countries will include uh, refugee advisories as part of their national delegations. As it was outlined by my fellow panelists, it's states that hold a commitment, it's states that hold their responsibility and it's states that make the decisions. So at the end of the day, we want refugees to be sitting with states when those decisions are being made and that's the importance of having refugee advisors in national delegations. Meaningful refugee participation is seen as a major area of innovation for the governments of the global refugee regime. It is not only an imperative under the relevant human rights frameworks governing the space, but also an effective approach to enhance global refugee responses. Refugees are often first responders and innovators in addressing the challenges they face and therefore develop policy and programming expertise. Meaningful refugee participation evolving, is evolving to an emerging norm within the UNHCR 
uh, global refugee uh, system. And it is important to shift the, discuss the discussion at this juncture from if it is relevant to include refugees to how it can be implemented in practice and in, and in policy processes. Refugee advisory boards are just one way in which you can make that happen, but there's multiple different avenues. So in closing, um, I don't know if I said too much or too little, but um, in closing, meaningful participation of affected populations is imperative for the whole of society approach that is central for both the GCR and the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. Including directly impacted people can lead to dynamic, effective, and global res globally responsive strategies. At our seat, we seek to pay we seek to pave the way for a future where meaningful refugee participation isn't just welcomed, but is seen as an essential component in crafting solutions and responses. Including those with lived experience in multilateral meetings is not a panacea or a, a, a total solution for the numerous gaps, hardships, and challenges faced by refugees and marginalized communities around the world. Nonetheless, meaningful participation could help address issues of legitimacy, eff efficacy, and accountability within the UN system. Including refugee voices in decision-making processes at the UN can indeed shift the power imbalance that the current system um, has and result in refugees having tangible influence on how countries respond to the human rights issues that directly impact their lives. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Happy to be here and, and continue the conversation. Thank you so very much, Marisa, for this very powerful, relevant contribution. I think it showcases a very concrete example of human rights of refugees being implemented uh, and, and the fight behind it, uh, the, all the work that, that goes into it. Uh, as I previously mentioned to, to Marisa, I'm really happy that uh, um, the, the paragraphs on academic participation and on meaningful participation of, of, of refugees in the uh, GCR are mirror images. So we have 34 and 43, which just remind us that we always need to work together and go together. And uh, we, from game, Jeff, myself, and our all our partners, we have been trying to increase uh, academic engagement for refugees, with refugees, and by refugees. So to have more refugees scholars, and uh, also to to always um, try to to recall that uh, refugee participation should not be an item on a checklist, as you said, it should be there from the beginning and and part of of all project designs and all decision making. Thank you so very much for for your powerful uh, contribution. Uh, before I share uh, the floor with Maria Beatriz for her, her reactions, uh, just one uh, issue of housekeeping. Uh, we are going to post on the chat a little form that, that anyone who wants to to have a certificate for participation in the session needs to uh, to complete this. So it's going to be there. You can uh, you can fill it out uh, once uh, you you want. Uh, with that said, we can go back to, to our content uh, uh, part of the of, of the session, and I'm really pleased to have Maria Beatriz. Uh, join us uh, as a debater. I'm sure she'll have a lot to say, especially because her PhD thesis was on internal displacement. So when Jeff started talking about the guiding principles, I said, oh, it, 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 uh, Christmas has come early for Bia because she's going to to, to be very happy to, to, to be talking uh, about this. I know she's really engaged uh, with um, the, the issue of meaningful refugee participation and uh, the, the, the perspective uh, here in Brazil. So it was also really nice to hear Marisa mention this um, very uh, uh, promising discussions, I think, uh, in terms of uh, Brazil being um, joining this, uh, this fight for meaningful refugee participation. And of course, she's from UNHCR, so I'm, I'm, I know she has been uh, drinking up every word that Madeline was, was mentioning in, in her speech. Uh, Maria Beatriz, the, the floor is all yours, and thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you so much, uh, Liliana, for the opportunity to hear and to learn so much from Jeff, uh, and Madeline, and Marisa uh, this morning. Uh, this, uh, I'm not going to uh, say a lot of things, but just uh, some thoughts that came to my mind uh, listening to, to this very powerful 
uh, talks and complementary ones. I'm going to say just a little bit from the perspective of the, the field, as I mean, as uh, I'm working here from Sao Paulo with local authorities, uh, local NGOs, local refugee led organizations, and how this resonates uh, from someone who's working on the field. Um, first, uh, I couldn't start by also adding one other anniversary to our list. Uh, we are also talking about the anniversary, talking about regional instruments, the anniversary of the American Declaration of the Rights of Men, who in the Article 27 talks about the right to seek and be granted asylum, which is a human right that was also enshrined in the uh, American Convention. We normally, we like very much just to talk about the Declaration and the Convention because it has a, a little bit of a stronger language talking about the right to seek and be granted asylum and the implications of such a right in states in our region establishing fair and effective and open asylum systems to all those in need of international protection. And also talking about IDPs, and it was wonderful that Jeff reminded us of the anniversary. And of course, it, for me, it is uh, it, it was a joy also always to to learn from the guiding principles, and they are so inspiring and effective that they managed to inspire a local legislation even before it uh, they were the principles were adopted. We have here in our region in Colombia. Uh, uh, national legislation on the protection of internally displaced, for instance, from 1997, that drank not only from the compilation and analysis of legal norms that were that informed the guiding principles, but also from the discussions that were happening in the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights on uh, rights of people who were internally displaced. So these instruments are very, from, from the perspective of our region, very effective in creating and inspiring local legislation and improving uh, national asylum systems. When I saw the, uh, the theme of today's talk, which was the, both anniversaries of, the, of the, uh, the Global Compact on Refugees and the Universal Declaration, I was thinking about exactly the complementarity between the, the instruments. One talked both uh, resolutions, as Jeff said, both one talking about individual rights and the the rights to seek and enjoy asylum mostly and the global compact talking about exactly what what madeline said that it cannot be implemented by states alone we need to have international cooperation we need to have a multilateral system that works so besides individual commitments on uh, resettlement or visa schemes or we need a, a global system that works we need uh, responsibility sharing so that people in need of international protection uh, so that countries that not countries that do not are not part of the 951 convention for instance but uh, adhere to the principles of customary international law continue doing so because all the others are doing it. So I was thinking about how it is important to have this, this understanding of multilateral international cooperation for individual rights in this area of, of asylum and refugeehood to be actually implemented. And the Global Compact on Refugees is very important for those of us who are working here with local authorities because specifically what Madeleine and Marisa said of the whole of society approach. Jeff talked about commitment, that the compact needs commitment to be implemented, but we are talking about not only commitment from national governments. We need commitment from cities. We need commitment from states and local authorities who end up being the first respondents of, of the influxes they arrive. They are the ones who are providing health. They are the ones who are providing other rights also enshrined in our universal declaration. They are the ones who are providing access to health systems, to educational systems, to sheltering, to social benefits, to language inclusion, which is, has been a very big challenge nowadays for us here in, in Sao Paulo, where I, where I act, where we are receiving constantly the arrival of Afghan refugees. 
who who speak a language very far from Portuguese. So if you don't have that, you don't have protection. So we are talking about very concrete, very local commitments that are informed to us here in the field by the by the uh, uh, global compact, especially those of us working in urban areas. I'm I'm working both in an in a continental sized country with refugees and people in need of international protection coming to Brazil from many different border points. So, and from many, many different cities. And we are talking about people living in very densely urban areas. Here in Sao Paulo, we are 12 million people city with a lot of people in, in different parts of the city. So besides, uh, so we have to be creative in terms of, uh, of devising solutions and involving refugee-led organizations, community groups, faith-based organizations, companies, private sector. So these are the kinds of commitments that we are trying to work on informed by, by international, legis international law and also by the global compact. And, and listening to just a, a last remark before I make a, a, a question, listening very much to Marissa, uh, we are in a very special moment here in Brazil to be able to effect the kind of change and the kind of engagement that you were talking about in terms of minimal participation. Uh, the national government uh, and local governments are devising new tools, new legislations in terms of refugee and migrant inclusion in Brazil. Uh, recently, it was launched a, uh, a national network of cities and cities being understood as networks themselves of refugee-led organizations, organizations of civil society, faith-based organizations. So we have more than 50 cities now in Brazil engaged in sharing good practices on how to put forward local legislation, draft local development plans in order to, in a very uh, participatory way, you know, in order to devise inclusion. Uh, there is also, most probably is going to be launched next year in Brazil, uh, a national council for refugees, migrants, and stateless persons. And we here in the field will make sure, Marissa, that this council can be somehow considered a refugee advisory board also for Brazil. So we are exactly in the moment of this discussion. So we will make sure to, to, to better understand uh, the proposals of creating refugee advisory boards and make sure that the council, which is being currently discussed, meets the criteria for it be considered as such. And also finally here in Brazil, we are also discussing uh, a new national policy on migrants and refugees and stateless persons and how this policy is going to be discussed. It's going to be drafted, designed and discussed through consultation local on local, state and national levels. So in the next three months, I will be very much engaged along with Liliana and along with all uh, those who are who are who work and who are advocates for the for for, ref, for refugee inclusion in Brazil. We will have many many municipal and state conferences to be able to uh, allow meaningful participation of local communities and organizations. So they then talk. So, so proposals can be made for a national policy on migrants, refugees, and stateless persons to be drafted as legislation in Brazil and as legislation be the basis, the principled basis for a national four-year uh, work plan that will guide with targets, indicators, ministries, responsible budget, what are going to be our main action, strategic actions for the next four years. So we are in a very special moment nationally and we would like to take very much the advantage of the pledges and the discussions that are going to be made in the Global Forum. All of you who are going to be there, please let me know afterwards everything, the, the, the innovations and the pledges and everything that is, that is going on in Geneva, because us in a few to depend very much on these kinds of commitments and this cooperation so we can advance uh, locally. So these are some of my, my thoughts, and I would like to pose perhaps a question, Liliana, if I can, uh, to this panel. Uh, based on what was said, I would like to hear a little bit from Jeff, Madeline, and Marissa. At this moment that you are going to Geneva for the Global Forum, what kind of uh, multilateral commitments, what kind of commitments are you expecting to hear from the states together in order for us to uh, uh, make sure 
that Article 14, the right to seek and enjoy asylum, is granted in a wider basis, is secured in, 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 a, in a time where you have more than 110 million people forcibly displaced. So what kind of commitment are you eager to hear uh, in the next days? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria Beatriz, for all these very insightful comments and also for sharing the perspectives here uh, from Brazil, which uh, I think are exciting, lots of work, and we hope that all of these uh, comes to fruition with better protection for refugees and other uh, persons in need of international protection. Uh, I'm going to, to give the floor to the panelists. I don't know who wants to, to go first on this very a uh, relevant uh, and complex question that that Maria Beatriz uh, has has posed to to all of us. Um, I don't know, Madel Jeff goes first, so the floor is yours, Jeff. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a commitment we won't get, uh, which is tragic, because to my mind, it's the one that we actually need most. If you go towards the end of the Global Compact, you will see that the focus is on solutions. Solutions require the working together of states and other actors, but also the Security Council, because the humanitarian peace development nexus requires peace and the role of the Security Council, if it happens to have forgotten it lately, is to maintain international peace and security. You will not get voluntary repatriation to a safe, durable, sustainable solution without a transitional process that allows refugees and other displaced persons to participate in forming the new government, but without pressure from the Security Council there will be no real effective change in so many of the situations that have led to the massive numbers who are no longer safe in their own homes. When you think that I believe it's something like three countries on the planet give rise to something like 67% of persons within the UNHCR's mandate. It's something ridiculous like that, okay? You realize that without intervention by the Security Council, we are going nowhere fast. So that is the one pledge I would like to see, but I'm not holding my breath. Thank you, Jeff. Madeline, please. Thank you, Liliana, if I can come in. And really, let me also just really thank both Marisa and Maria Beatriz for their particularly insightful interventions. And in terms of what we, some of the things we hope to see, um, let me say one is responding really to what Marisa has highlighted as a crucial need, more to be done to ensure that there is truly meaningful participation of refugees, not just in big international events, but in the actual programs, policies, activities that states and international organizations and local governments and all of the others working in this field uh, are, are doing. Um, I think we've made progress, although not enough, and I'll say that straight away. Uh, and perhaps I can point to one particular high level side event that will be taking place next Thursday, the 14th, uh, if I recall well. And this is one where we're going to actually have as the moderator and chair, a uh, former refugee, Mrs. Omaima Imrayev, who is a lawyer at DLA Piper, a law firm, which is a major contributor to the pro bono pledge I mentioned earlier. And the first intervention, um, entitled Harnessing the Power of Collective Action is going to be made by Mr. Ibrahim Abu Sena, who's the director of the Refugee Legal Aid Program at St. Andrew's Refugee Services in Egypt, um, and who is himself also uh, a refugee. So I'm really encouraged to see that it's two refugees who are leading 
this important side event, which is focusing on access to protection, asylum systems, legal assistance, and human rights. And this event, we hope, is really uh, going to ensure that attention is focused directly and centrally on these key areas. There's many different important aspects of the Global Compact, of course, that go into all forms of services, to uh, to to uh, uh, attention to vulnerabilities, to uh, uh, many other kinds of activities that are around refugee protection, but it's very positive from our viewpoint that we have this as one of the key events that's going to bring everybody's mind back, we hope, to the binding legal obligations, which are essential to ensure that people can actually be protected. We have a number of interveners who have asked to take the floor at that event. Uh, in addition to the panelists who are going to speak to some big stakeholder pledges around uh, uh, national human rights institutions, around um, uh, uh, addressing trafficking. Um, and the list is growing, which is promising. We've had, in addition to the European Asylum Support Office, which will make a pledge on supporting family reunification for refugees, the first time EUAA has gone, embarked in this area. We have Algeria, Mercosur, Uruguay, the Jordan, uh, Jordan Syrian Refugee Affairs Directorate, we have uh, the Azile Project, we have the Danish Refugee Council, we have Germany, Australia, Austria, and a long list of other states that have asked for the floor, such that we think we're going to have to add two or three hours to this event if we're going to get through them all. Um, no, but that won't actually happen. But there will be coming out of that a written record of all of the pledges that those who have signaled interest in this event are going to make. Um, and so, you know, as a black letter lawyer, I have to say I'm very gratified to see that these legal commitments are the subject of pledges. And I hope that what we're going to see not only next week, but then in the months and years to come is concrete action to take them from paper and put them into reality and practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. As Jeff uh, likes very much when, when I mentioned this metaphor, uh, I always say that the G GRF is the wedding day and then comes the marriage. So we need to just make the commitments, but then apply them in our daily practice for the next four years, not just coming there and celebrate, although we have this growing list of anniversaries that have, we have been mentioned uh, in, in our talk. Our cake just needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, Marisa? Yeah, and thank you so much uh, for the question and, and for uh, your remarks, Maria Beatriz. Um, I think in a similar line with uh, what Madeline was saying, um, we really want to see that states and other stakeholders, as Liliana said, uh, academia is really important. And I know that academia has the shifting power pledge on, on, on localization of research, which is extremely important. Um, but we, what we're really looking forward is that meaningful refugee participation is institutionalized, is sustainable. It's not a one-off come to this meeting that happens in Geneva every four years, and then that's it, we never talk again. Um, as I mentioned, we have 10 countries that will have a refugee advisor in their delegation, but we only have officially four countries that have created refugee advisory mechanisms that sit at the national level and that interact with the government on an ongoing basis, um, whether it's national or international policy and programming. Um, so we're really looking forward to hear more more commitments about institutionalizing the practice, having this advisory uh, bodies that are selected in a way that I was mentioning that's transparent, that's non-tokenistic, that refugees are being chosen not only because of their lived experience of forced displacement, but because they are they have developed expertise and, and technical knowledge by working with their communities in their respective countries. Um, so we're really looking forward to that, and as I mentioned, um, and it's been mentioned multiple times, it is really a whole of society approach. So the support of academia, of private donors, of uh, INGOs, NGOs, everyone that's included in this process is, is really important and how they integrate refugees as well in their work. Um, so we're we, that's what we're looking forward to have even more commitment on this institutionalized practice of meaningful refugee participation and for it to be sustainable. Um, the mechanisms 
have uh, two year cohorts. Um, so it's not the same people that constantly interact with the government. There is a rotation to ensure diversity and inclusion. Um, and also the selection committee usually does a process that involves interviews, that involves recommendation letters, that involves um, just ensuring that the people that are selected are selected because of the policy and every and their knowledge that they can bring to the table. So we hope that once they are at the table, um, states and other stakeholders will meaningfully engage them and keep it as a sustainable practice. I know that a big challenge is how um, the politics change, uh, as many Beatriz was saying in, 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 in Brazil right now, it's a really uh, favorable, you know, uh, friendly environment to do this this um, type of work before it wasn't. Um, so um, it's ensuring that those mechanisms are sitting at the national level that we're working with bureaucrats, with, with not necessarily politicians, but with people that are in the ground implementing the programs and the policies and that they can continue to live on despite um, political changes and so on. So yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. And, and hopefully in the next year off, we'll have you know, 20 countries with refugee advisors and 15 that have created boards or something like that. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Thank you so much, Marisa. Uh, I, I know I'm not a panelist, but if you if you just uh, allow me uh, to, 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 to chime in on, on this, I think we, we do also should aim for a very basic pledge that international refugee law is respected in all its aspects, that we have integral protection for refugees in terms of all rights, uh, refugee rights and human rights, and that uh, everything that's complementary is actually complementary for other people in need of protection and not a precarization of refugees' rights. Because I think we have been also seeing that states are um, trying to prioritize other forms of protection. Uh, and this has been leading uh, to several challenges in refugee protection. So I think sometimes we, we all need to, to also go back to, to the basics, especially if we are talking about uh, this perspective of uh, human rights and refugee uh, refugee protection. Uh, but this is not to end on, on a depressing note or anything like that. It's just for us to, to reaffirm the, the essentials and I think a very um, transversal topic that has been uh, going on in, in all of, of the lectures. Uh, as we are almost uh, out of time and I saw that there were, there were no questions on chats, only some comments that we'll be sharing with our panelists especially in terms of trafficking of persons and how this can affect uh, refugee protection. Uh, I'm going to start thanking everyone for being here, uh, saying that uh, from the perspective from our uh, research group, the Human Rights and Vulnerabilities Research Group, and our DeMello chair here at Universidade Católica de Santos, uh, this event in partnership with the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network is part of this series on human rights. And of course, we wouldn't uh, uh, be satisfied if we didn't have these talks on refugees, uh, human rights, and also uh, these perspectives uh, in terms of what can be celebrated in the anniversaries of all these very relevant documents. Uh, we, are, we are very honored to have um, Professor Gilbert, Dr. Garlic, Marisa, Maria Beatriz joining us. And we hope that you found it very uh, insightful, instructive, and uh, a way for us to think about this very relevant uh, topic. To, so to take this occasion of celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the five anniversary of the Global Compact of Refugees, plus the guiding principles, plus the Brazilian national constitution, the American declaration, uh, next year Cartagena, and we forgot the Vienna declaration, who is very relevant uh, for uh, implementation of human rights. So it, it has the 30th uh, anniversary as well. And, and think uh, of these moments as ways, like we have on World Refugee Day, not to celebrate, but to think about and reflect and on points of actions and how to better um, uh, implement protection and solution for refugees. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And once we have this uploaded, I'll share the link with all of you. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Take care.